Hello and welcome. In this video, we're going to talk about the linear discriminant analysis. In fact, any study relative to predictive modeling would be incomplete without knowing linear discriminant analysis. It's one of the classical models, would fall in the category of statistical models like linear regression and logistic regression, but it's a very powerful model. Now, generally, the explanation relative to linear discriminant analysis that's available is quite math heavy. Therefore, in this video, we are trying to make this very simple and intuitive for you. Let's get started. So let's first begin by understanding what is a good classifier. Let's say we have two classes, the reds and the blues. How do we find out that a classifier is good? First, let's understand the data. Data relative to the red class and the blue class. So let's say the red class has a mean mu1 and a standard deviation s1. Likewise, the blue class has a mean mu2 and a standard deviation s2. As of now, we can visually see that we can draw a line which would be separating the two classes. But if we try to rearrange this data a little bit, let's understand would that be a good classification or not? So for example, in this case, if you see, now the data is kind of overlapping. Essentially what has happened is that keeping the shape of the data same, which is governed by the standard deviation. So standard deviation is a measure of how far the points are from the mean in general. Keeping the shape of the data same, we are trying to bring the data close by bringing the means closer. Same is the case with the blue class, where keeping the shape same, we brought it closer to the red class. Now, as of now, if you see which scenario gives the better classification. If I were to draw a line here, I could easily do a segregation between reds and blues. But can I conveniently draw a line here and separate the two classes? Answer is no, because there are a lot of places where blues and reds are kind of overlapping. So what has happened in this case is that keeping the standard deviations or the shape of the data same, we have brought mu1 and mu2, the means closer, and which has made the situation worse for us. There's another possibility. Let's look at that. What has happened now? Looks like the points have moved farther from the center, which means in this case, for the class which is represented by the red color, looks like the standard deviation would have gone up. And so is the case with the blue class. Points are far separated from the mean, so we can say that the standard deviation seems to have gone up. But at the same time, we are keeping the means static. So we've not touched the distance between mu1 and mu2 as it was there in the original data is what is intact here. However, let's see if we are able to get a good classification. Probably you can see this is again not a good classification. Why? Because some of these blue points have entered this zone, which would have been separated for the reds. And some of these red points have entered this zone, which would have been reserved for blues. So we see that in case we keep the mu1 and mu2 same, the means at the same location, but increase the standard deviations or the spread of the data, that again would make the things worse for us. We are not able to do a good classification. So with the help of this, do we understand a general characteristic for a good classifier? Can we say that a good classifier will try to keep mu1 and mu2 apart, which means the classes should have well-separated means and should have controlled standard deviations, which means the points should be pretty range-bound and closely bound to the group to which they belong. And then it is always easier for a classifier to draw a line and separate the two classes or perform a classification task. So if you've understood this, you've understood an important portion relative to linear discriminant analysis. We'll come back to the same point in some time. Let's look at the second pillar for linear discriminant analysis, which is the idea of projection. So in general, if you've studied linear algebra, you would know about projections, but let's talk in a very common language. What is a projection? So let's say I want to take a projection of these points on this axis. What does it mean? It simply means that I'm looking at these points from here, from this direction. So I do not look at the 2D like you see it on the screen right now, but imagine you standing here and looking at these points like these. So what would you see? You would see something like a projection of these points. It would be a one dimensional view for you. Similarly, for these blue points, what will be the projection? Something like this. So if we take a projection of these points together on feature one, what would it look like? That's what I meant when I said you're looking at it from this direction. You're not able to look at feature two. And let's say feature two is not even present. All you're trying to do is you're trying to separate these two classes with the help of feature one by taking the projection of these points on feature one. Are we able to do a good classification? 
Probably not, because you can see a lot of places, blues and reds are kind of overlapping. However, going back to the data, we could have tried taking the projection on feature two as well, and let's see if that looks any better. So imagine you're looking at these points only from the direction of feature two now. If we do that, this is the outcome. At least we are able to draw a line which is separating the two classes. So this is definitely better than what we were able to get through feature one. But is this great? Probably not. So moving on for the same data, can we try to take a projection in some other direction which will give us a better separation of the two classes? Let's give it a try. What if we choose this as the axis on which we want to take the projection? And you can imagine when you're looking at these points from this direction. When we take the projection of these points on this axis, what happens? Probably this is a better classification. First, because you see a good gap between these points. But let's put all of these projections together and then do a comparison. So the first case was the projection onto feature one. Second case was projection onto feature two. And third case that we just looked at is projection on something new, a new axis. Can you guess which one is better? And while doing that, keep the properties of a good classifier in mind. A good classifier would try to separate the means and keep the standard deviations low. In the first case, the means are not very separate. The points are overlapping. In the second case, the means are somewhat separate, but if you see, the standard deviations are not low. In fact, this has pretty high standard deviations. Do we get a trade-off in the third example? The means are very nicely separated. The mean would be somewhere here for the blue class and for the red class, it'll be somewhere here. And also the points are relatively well contained compared to the mean, not as spread out as you can see for the projection on feature two. So if we do a comparison between these three options, you would probably say the third option seems to be a better classifier. And if you understood this much, then you understood a great deal about linear discriminant analysis. A linear discriminant analysis would project the data onto a new axis to achieve the classification. But there must be a mathematical function that governs this. And that is pretty simple. If you've understood the logic, the mathematical function is pretty easy. And this is a pretty straightforward equation. What are we saying? We're trying to maximize this entire piece, this ratio. In the numerator, we have the difference between mu1 and mu2. We square it because if we just take the difference, it could be positive or negative. But when we square it, it will always be positive. So if the difference between mu1 and mu2 is high, this would maximize this ratio. On the other hand, if the values in the denominator are low, which means the standard deviation of the class one and class two are low, then denominator itself would be low and that in turn supports maximization of this ratio. Lower the denominator, greater the ratio. So both ways, keeping the means apart and the standard deviations low, the linear discriminant analysis finds out a discriminant function which separates the two classes. This was about two classes. What would be the case if we do a multi-class classification. For example, let's say we have three classes, not just reds and blues, but we also have these greens here. And for each of these classes, we can calculate the mean and standard deviation, just like the way we had it earlier. Now, the question is, how do we actually find out a discriminant function? So it turns out that you will find out a centroid of these classes, which is something like this. And then you can join the means of each of the classes with this centroid something like this. So this is the distance between the mean of class one and the overall centroid. This is the distance between mean of class three and the overall centroid and so on. Let's say these distances are labeled as D1, D2, and D3. So what will be the new mathematical function? The new mathematical function would be the summation of D1 square plus D2 square plus D3 square divided by S1 square plus S2 square plus S3 square. Notice that in order to just make it intuitive for you, we have written it like this. But in reality, the linear discriminant analysis would always find these values on the projections, not on the actual data points, which is how it was shown here. So this is on the projected data, you're looking at the difference between the means and the standard deviations, not on the original data. Just wanted to call that out. Now, as I said, linear discriminant analysis belongs to the family of statistical models like linear regression and logistic regression. So statistical models in general tend to be a little heavy on assumptions. What are the assumptions involved? First of all, we are using means and standard deviations here 
In fact, we are also using variance covariance matrix. That's the math part of the linear discriminant analysis. Therefore, linear discriminant analysis is sensitive to the presence of outliers. If you have outliers present, it may not give you the best classification. Second point, linear discriminant analysis assumes that the features are independent. Explanatory variables are independent of each other. Thus, it is also sensitive to the presence of multi-collinearity. And lastly, it does not necessarily require the data to be scaled because if you saw the mathematical function, it was kind of a ratio. But if the scales are too different, then that begins to affect. So it's a good practice for the convergence of the algorithms and for the consistency of the results that you scale the data before performing linear discriminant analysis. All right, that was it. So I hope you get clarity on linear discriminant analysis. You'll see more of it when we apply it to a real data in the hands-on piece. Thank you for watching.